stand on their shoulders, the beautiful people sitting and standing beside you now, and those precious, beautiful little ones that follow in our footsteps. Good morning, everyone. I'm Belinda Russen. I'm the chair of the Rona Tramby Trust and the CEO of Tramby National Indigenous Adult Education and Training. Thank you for joining us here today at Tramby for our Armistice Centenary Ceremony, honouring Indigenous and non-Indigenous soldiers of World War I. I represent the New South Wales Jewish Board of Deputies on the Rona Tramby Trust. And in that capacity, I've had the privilege of being part of the Australian Light Horse Project since 2016, when the plans for the project began. The project supports recording the stories of Indigenous World War I soldiers of the famous Australian Light Horse, as told by their descendants. On a personal level, it has been very special to meet and get to know the participants and to hear their stories, to travel to Israel with them and to share in remembering and honoring our World War I soldiers. Being at the places where they fought and imagining what they went through was a moving and humbling experience for us all. I will finish by reading from an article written later in life by my great uncle Lionel Trem, who fought in the First Light Horse Regiment and was on the battlefield at Beersheba. He says, I still remember vividly being out on the flat all day, watching and waiting for the forts on our right to fall and getting bombed occasionally. Then in the afternoon, starting to advance on foot. We were just coming under fire when I saw away to our left horses galloping. They were the 4th and 12th Australian Light Horse. I remember our point of advance was a minaret in the town. We met little resistance the charge of the 4th and 12th had broken the turf. The Rona Tranby Trust Australian Light Horse Project supports recording the stories of Indigenous World War I soldiers of the famous Australian Light Horse as told by their descendants. Applications were received from around Australia and 13 descendants were selected to take part in this project. I'm a Goodrich Mara woman I'm from the southwest of Victoria. Um, I'm the great niece of Alan McDonald who served in the um, Light Horse Brigade, the 8th um, Light Horse. I'm Peter Flynn, I'm um, the great niece of Charles Stafford and he had two other brothers who were in World War I who were both in the Light Horse. Um, he was actually in the Battle of Beersheba, so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to go and see the area that he was in. There was a small little badge that had the picture of the three boys, and we sent out, we went through Iaxis and the War Memorial trying to find out who the other two people were, and we actually found out it was the two brothers. So it was John, Charles and Clyde. So we would like to formalise a little bit more of the research that we, we have done so far. So a lot of it's a big collection, but just trying to get it into something that's more readable so that my daughter and my nieces and nephews can actually take it into their schools and into their communities and actually be proud of, of who we are and where we come from. I'm um, doing this project uh, because my grandfather served in the 11th Lifeless Regiment in the army base which was Moaska. He, um, the commander of the army base was Banjo Patterson. So I think it's an interesting 
um, and that would be the case for most of the 11th light horsemen, I would say. So it's 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 a it's an Australian story, but it's about Indigenous people, mm -hmm. and I think that's that has wide appeal, not just for Aboriginal people, because it's a great they're great stories. Mm -hmm. So I'm really passionate about the story that he's that I get to tell on his behalf. Mm -hmm. The Australian Light Horse was a feared mounted infantry army and played a key role in fighting with British forces against the Turkish Empire in World War I. The most distinctive part of their uniform was the khaki slouch hat with the emu feathers. Ancestors of two of the 13 descendants rode in the legendary charge of the 4th Australian Light Horse Brigade. The charge, on 31st of October 1917, was at the end of the day of fierce fighting and broke through the Turkish lines, capturing the key town of Beersheba. This was a turning point in the war, forcing the Turkish army into full retreat and leading to ultimate victory a year later. The Australian Light Horse Project funded the participants to travel to Beersheba in Israel to take part in the Australian National Service on the 31st of October 2017. The service commemorated the centenary of the Battle of Beersheba. The Australian Department of Veteran Affairs endorsed the project. They arranged for one of the participants to lay a wreath during the official service at Beersheba, which was attended by the Prime Minister of Australia and Israel. Representatives from other countries, dignitaries, international visitors, and the local community. For the first time in 100 years, a wreath was laid by an Indigenous soldier and representative in honour of Indigenous servicemen who fought in the campaign. My name is Ricky Morris. I'm um, Kunjima, South West Victoria. I guess for Grandad Frederick Amos Lovett and the Five Brothers, I guess my story is going to be about what motivated the five men from a mission, young men, uh, wanting to join the Defence Force, and what happened between 1916 and 1917, where Grandad was too short to join, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden he was of significant British origin. Three things uh, bring me together, I guess, uh, that I acknowledge uh, as a serviceman myself, is um, when I went to Afghanistan, uh, out in the front lines there, I thought, oh, this might be what Grandad felt like. And, uh, Certainly when the first bullet went over my head, I said, this definitely must be my friend. Also, the relationship you have with your fallen comrades, your fallen friends, and we lost four uh, mates over there, so to speak. Um, what's unique about today is one of them was uh, Private Greg Shear, and we'd done the round ceremony for Greg, um, and I also followed their, their journey back home, and he was of the Jewish faith in Melbourne, and um, the send-off he had there, uh, mixed with the military and the Jewish uh, community of Melbourne, was just enormous. And it reminded me of our, our, our parsons of our family and our family members, how big our community come together mm -hmm. for that. So that's unique. And um, certainly as a light horseman myself, uh, Beersheba Day is a big day for us mm -hmm. in the mess. It gets even messier at the end of the day <laughs> uh, because we celebrate the, the fallen soldiers of the charge of the light horse uh, mm -hmm. every year. So that's going to be unique for me as well. It was a highlight and a proud moment during the service when the announcement of the wreath was made and the Indigenous descendants and their supporters rose up as one in the stands and cheered. Inspiringly, after three days riding in the desert, three of the participants rode in the centenary parade through the town of Beersheba, and then took part in the reenactment of the charge that followed the official service. And they were riding in full light horse uniform. Another of the participants was very moved. He was the first in his family to visit the grave of his great uncle at the Beersheba War Cemetery. I felt very honoured and privileged, and um, mainly for the sake of his mother who never got the opportunity to visit his grave and um, it's just a, an immense 
feeling of um, pride for what he'd uh, sacrificed. He gave his life for a country that really didn't care much about him. My three great uncles were served in the Middle East all at the same time. Two of my great uncles were light horsemen. And one is buried at Besheva. They all came from Pilia, which is in the northwestern New South Wales. And um, when um, great uncle Bertie came home, he brought home a date palm seed and he planted it at the uh, kitchen window of the old family residence in Pilligo. And that tree grew. It's now probably about 40 foot high and it's um, still standing today. And the local school in Pilligo, they go and have an Anzac service there every, every year. On their return to Australia, the participants of the Australian Light Horse Project are continuing to research the stories of their ancestors and they're interviewing their families and community members. On the 27th of April 2018, a reception was held at Government House in honour of the participants of the project and the fine military service of their ancestors. Today is the 11th of November 2018, the centenary of the armistice for World War I. When the guns finally fell silent after more than four years of destruction and warfare, the participants have gathered here at Tranby to take part in a centenary Remembrance Day ceremony and to mount an exhibition telling the stories of their ancestors and their participation in the project. The Rona Tranby Trust Australian Light Horse Project is a unique project. It honours the contribution made by Indigenous World War I soldiers, a contribution that was largely unknown in the wider Australian community until recently. The project made a significant contribution to the centenary commemorations at Beersheba in 2017 and will add to the historical and cultural record of World War I and to reconciliation in Australia. What was I thinking and feeling about my grandfather when I was in Israel and after I returned? Well, it's a very complex question because it can bring so many different emotions into my spirit and mind. But uh, one of the reasons why I went over there was actually he was my grandfather that I didn't know. And that was only because of the Aboriginal Protection Acts that kept us separated from a lot of our relatives and our ancestors. And so to go over there to try to, I was searching for my grandfather, trying to find him and, and connect with him in some way. And it was on the battlefront that I had that first knowledge and experience spiritually of, of my grandfather. And there was a moment when I was on a horse riding through the uh, streets of Beersheba and the people of that town came out and started thanking all of the light horse for what they had achieved back there 100 years ago. And I said to my grandfather then and there, I said, Grandfather, there's thanking you. And that's when I felt that peace in my spirit that, uh, you know, he felt that same uh, experience of uh, being a part of a huge big campaign. And he was just one small part of that battle. And uh, I just felt it in a deep way. There was a number of really memorable experiences during my time in Turkey. Egypt and Israel. I think the opportunity to travel to Gallipoli and all the other sites where not only my great uncle who I was paying respects to but following in his footsteps his brother, my grandfather, had fought during the Middle East campaign of the Second World War. I was able to see that the landscapes that they experienced and thinking about some of the stories from their time there it gave me an opportunity to just connect with them in a way that I wasn't able to previously. I felt moved. It was um, a great experience. See, I first found out about my granddad when I worked at the War Memorial in Canberra. Uh, my mother told me that he was in the First World War, but 
when I worked there, I picked up on his records saying that he was in the 12th Light Horse. And shortly after that, I became a Christian. And reading a book called The 800 Light Horseman, and parts of the book was mentioned about Harry Cheval, how he um, led the charge, and all of a sudden, the 12th Light Horse people, men, rode away from him. And the feelings um, started coming down. I mean, you know, I, I started weeping, started, but it was really good feelings. They weren't sad, they were happy tears. Um, and being over in Israel, walking around where these men rode, and it was, um, you know, there's nothing like it. And uh, someone said, my mum wanted to have this story told. And today it's going to be told. Yeah. I just met a lady from Tamar. So I rode with my grandfather when he was in processions up in Tamar for Namada. Listen to that, let's see a movie. For much of the past century, Indigenous Australians who enlisted during the First World War have remained in the shadows. Their service unrecognised and their stories largely unknown. Yet Indigenous soldiers, Many thousands of individuals served in almost every branch of the Australian Imperial Force. They were among the wounded, among those who earned bravery awards, among the many who returned home after the war had ended, and they were among the tens of thousands who lost their lives and now lie buried in graves from the Middle East to Western Europe. There were men like Jack Stacey, who enlisted at the age of 19 in May 1916. Jack was a country boy, a station hand from the far north of New South Wales. In his attestation papers, he described himself as a natural born British subject. Today, these men and women and the generations of indigenous service personnel who have followed are increasingly receiving the recognition that has long been their due, lest we forget. In the recognition of, of Harry's service is to go to Israel which we did last year, and go through those places where he actually served, and to see the hardship, the mateship, the stories, you know, they had to ride through the valleys of death, uh, getting fired upon by the Turks and the Arabs that were there, um, the heat, the flies, lack of water, lack of sleep, uh, but persevering, and, and that's what a lot of our servicemen of that era, the, the, the bravery, uh, for them to be able to do what they did. And so that's why I'm here today and that's why I went to Israel. And I hope that uh, my project uh, forms part of it, part of the story of the Black Diggers, uh, the 11th Flight Horse, uh, that uh, originally most of the members came from Queensland. Great grandfather went over there, not really knowing what he was um, going to but he knew that he, he was good with horses and that's where he wanted to work. He was there for four years. Wandering around the market, um, I, I've been thinking that, you know, what it must have been like for him, a totally foreign place for him to be, and how, how he would have looked at this place and been able to think about, you know, home and family and, being able to mix him with the locals and people that look like him and doing things that he would never have done before and I sort of like feel you know that I'm somewhere where that was that he was and I think that's what's really important to me. He came back at the end of the war and he wasn't a well man and he didn't get soldier settlement and while he was away his family were removed his children and grandchildren by the welfare and he spent a bit of his time trying to get them back and establish himself so that he could support the family. He only received entitlement of um, a war pension, which wasn't very much, only about one pound. And he asked them for his um, entitlement as an old age pension. He didn't get that either. So he came back to um, not being able to support his family and not having settlement, soldier settlement and living off the mission in difficult circumstances. My most memorable experience about the trip would have to be sharing it with my mum and having the opportunity to um, be there for family members or com other community members who didn't have their families with them. And just 
having the opportunity to ride through the desert on horseback and just following in the footsteps of my great grandfather as well and just sharing that moment and it was it was beautiful seeing my mum at various rendezvous points as well filming and or singing out and waving in the crowd and you could pick her out easily quite easily because her, she's got distinctive um, hair <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that made it even more memorable. I'm glad that I went on the trip over to Bushiba to see where my grandfather went. That was really an uh, experience to uh, remember because the um, people of Israel, they, were, uh, they had the uh, indigenous um, soldiers in high regard because they also helped re-establish Bushiba when they were over there in the war and they stayed beyond and they helped re-establish Bushiba. That was a highlight for me to see them and seeing the um, expressions and that on their face where they were crying in the street and then singing out for the Indigenous Army. And that, oh, that made me feel really proud of being there and sort of uh, when you sort of think about how hard it was back in them days, how hard it was back in them days and then it was just... Uh, just, just a remarkable journey, just a remarkable journey. The plans that I have for telling uh, my grandfather's story is that I'm writing a short book about before he went to war, during the conflict and upon his return to Australia. And from the, the short story that I'm working on, I'd like to develop that into a short film. I think because his story is a bit different to a lot of other returned servicemen's stories in that he was honoured when he returned to Australia and so I think uh, his story, like everybody else's ancestors' stories, is worth telling uh, because it's a bit of a different perspective. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I'd like to do. I was on the board here at Tramby for many years, probably over 20 years. Kevin Cook was the CEO here and he invited me uh, to be on the board and I ended up the chairman here for quite a few years. But the Rona Tramby, as I recall it, came about when we were approached by uh, the Jewish community. Uh, a bit of money had been left in a trust to bring up some links with an Aboriginal organisation uh, and Tramby had been selected. And the long and the short of that is that uh, Kevin Cook uh, it was basically the driving force behind it. I, we supported Kevin and everything he did. My name's Roland Grittiger. I was here in 1991 when we set this up. Di Rich was here in 1991 representing the Board of Deputies to help us put the oral history projects. I don't know if anybody else was here in 1991, but a, long, long, a lot of things have happened. We've managed to get it off the ground, we've managed to struggle, we've managed to create something which is quite unique in the fabric of the Australian community. Now, I'm a Holocaust survivor, so I think there is a very natural fit between the Jewish community and the Aboriginal community, and it has been just a wonderful opportunity in all these years to try to put together projects that allow for the cooperation of the Jewish community and the Aboriginal community. It was 27 years ago, on the 2nd of September 1991, that the Rona Tranby Trust was launched here at Tranby. The Trust is a philanthropic organisation that supports the recording and preservation of Indigenous Australian oral history. It was established from a bequest in the will of Thomas Rona. Tragically, Thomas and his wife Eva died in a car accident in 1987. The Ronas were Jewish. They were Holocaust survivors and active members of New South Wales' Jewish Board of Deputies.
many of their family members were murdered in Nazi concentration camps during World War II. As a result of their experiences, they took a keen interest in raising awareness of the Holocaust, promoting inter-ethnic harmony and social justice, and supporting Indigenous communities. In keeping with these values, Roland Gridiger, representing the trustees of Thomas Rona's estate, Kevin Torrey and Kevin Cook from Tranby, and Margaret Goodman from the New South Wales Jewish Board of Deputies were instrumental in creating the vision and establishing the trust. The idea of an oral history project emerged from a natural meeting point between Jewish and Indigenous communities. Both communities place a high value on understanding and learning from their history and passing on the stories of their ancestors to the next generation. In relation to the Australian Light Horse Project, the stories of both Indigenous and Jewish Anzacs are an inspiration and relatively unknown in the wider Australian community. To date, the Rona Tranby Trust has given 25 awards to support a range of Indigenous projects across Australia. Each award plants a seed that continues to grow over the years and helps to preserve stories important to all Australians, strengthening identity and community. When this project first started in the early 1990s, um, I was speaking to Kevin Cook here at Tranby, an absolutely wonderful man, and he was so happy that we were doing this. And he said to me, now the kids will hear the stories. And that is what it's all about. The kids and their kids and their kids, they will be there forever because of this wonderful project. Mm.